Now don't lose your head. We'll be reading the Walla Walla Garden City Gazette in just a minute. This issue is March 23rd, 1895. Mountain Mystery Cash containing 47 ounces of gold and $7,000 Located on Dry Creek Ridge No one has yet uncovered the treasure A cash containing $7,000 in coin and two gold nuggets weighing together 47 ounces is what a few of the residents on Dry Creek Mountain have been searching for so far, not many have been let into the secret that any such treasure is hidden away in the neighborhood. And for a long time, the information was in the possession of but one young man, the discoverer of the clue. And he kept his own counsel as long as he thought there was any chance of his uncovering the valuable metal. C.M. Churchill, Dixie, Washington, was the address an intelligent appearing young man left at the Gazette office last fall with the request that his name be put on our subscription books. He remarked that he was about to go back into the mountains above Dixie to cut cordwood during the winter and that he would want papers to read during the long evenings. He intended to batch and we learned that he would live entirely alone. We were interested in him and admired his pluck. He looked to be not more than 19 years of age, and he exhibited courage to contract to do work which would necessitate such solitude. Once or twice, we heard from our distant subscriber, and we sent him exchanges to read. When finally spring opened and he came out of the mountains, he favored our office with a call. At this time, he told us of an unusual discovery which he had made a few days before but requested that we say nothing about it for a while yet. Upon a promise that the Gazette should have full particulars, as soon as he was ready to give out his discovery, we let him go. Accordingly, today, we received the following by letter. DeWitt's Spring, Blue Mountains, March 19, 1895 To the Editor of the Gazette as you requested me to do, I send you the mysterious letter which I found hanging in a tree November 10, 1894. I found it on the south side of Dry Creek Mountain, between 12 and 18 miles from Dixie. It was hanging up in a spruce tree, 50 feet from the ground, and was encased in a rough block of wood. The block had been split, carved out on the inside, and nailed together again with what appeared to be steel pins from a cigar boxes although one end of the block hole had been cut with a knife. It appears that after this it was burned on the outside, which was probably to remove any appearance of newness. I cut down a large spruce near the spring, and the block was fastened to a small limb about 50 feet from the ground. It looks as if the limb had filled up the hole in the block and then died. The letter is written in scraps of paper which were evidently torn out of a notebook, and some of the lines are very dim. The words are spelled by phonetic system, if by any system at all. One end of the sheets of paper had been burned. This is where the hole was cut through the block that might have been hung on the limb. I have hunted for the treasure spoken of in the letter. The grove and surroundings are as described by the writer. So far, I have been unable to locate the cash definitely. Of course, it is possible that the man who wrote the note escaped from the Indians and afterwards returned for his gold. If this was the case, he probably was careless of the fate of this letter. If, on the other hand, this fugitive miner died with his fortune, his body would have been torn and scattered by wild beasts and the particular log or tree where the gold was hidden would fall away with decay and be covered up with fallen timber and overgrown with underbrush. From the appearance of the penciling, 
I should judge that the letter was written in a hurry by a person who do not write often, C. M. Churchill. The strange writing, as we are able to make out, is as follows. June 9th, 1863. These the rots of this spruce tree. I am listening to the poplin of a little spring and a writing these lines that I is going to hang in this tree. The man that finds this will find gold that is going to hid with myself in a holler log. One nugget is 29 ounces heavy will be found with my head on it. Another I in a crack on the south side of the mountain, 18 ounces heavy, the log and myself will be found in thick grove of trees a half mile to the left of this branch in a sort of gulch. The engines are a hunting me for this gold in my scalp. I want a right to get it. I found it in the Columbia River on their land. D. Stone from Corvallis, Oregon. There is $7,000 in a purse hid close to the gold. The spot where this was found is remote from any trail or line of travel. It is in a heavily wooded draw at the head of a canyon far back in the mountains. D. Stone, the writer, had evidently taken refuge there from the Indians. Why he did not come to Fort Walla Walla and avail himself of the protection of the army, which had but a short time previously been stationed in this valley, we can only conjecture. In 1863, when this letter was deposited, Walla Walla was a new settlement, simply a station for miners to gather in the winter time and to lay in supplies for the summer prospectoring. It was about this time that we are told a man was served for breakfast every morning. Gambling was the chief amusement, and it was no uncommon thing to see men shooting at one another across the street or across a card table. This was the advance guard of a higher civilization, and it required men of such character to prepare the way for those who should follow. In 1878, when George Savage, a jeweler in Walla Walla, moved to the summit of the divide between the east and south forks of the Kapiai Creek, an old man was discovered leading a solitary life and living in a log hut down in an unfrequented spot on the East Kapiai Canyon. There was no road nor trail made into his retreat, and he did not welcome visitors. The old fellow was eccentric and non-communicative. In most respects, he lived like an Indian. At last, he confided to George Savage, Jr., then a boy, that he lived in constant fear of being robbed. He even went so far as to exhibit gold in some quantities and gave the young man to understand that he concealed the money somewhere in the vicinity. One day, when one of the residents of that section in hunting stock rode past the lone man's cabin, he was startled to hear groans and heavy breathing. Breaking in, he found the hermit stretched out upon his bunk and apparently dying. He was delirious and kept mumbling something about a sack of gold in an old stump. He unfortunately died the next day. Enough of the precious metal was found about the place to indicate that there might be more hidden away as the old fellow had said. As no letters or papers are found to reveal the hermit's identity and to locate his relatives, a search was instituted by the people of the neighborhood for the buried fortune. It was conceded that the finder would be entitled to possession. So far it is known, no one has been lucky enough to discover the old man's bank. All that remains of the cabin is a few piled logs and the big red ground squirrels have covered these over with earth. The old man's grave is nearby.
A scene which appears strongly to me, and which would interest almost everyone, is a little shack on the north bank of the Columbia in sight of Rooster Rock. The building is known as Mint's Saloon. It has fallen almost to pieces and surrounded by drifts of wood and a dense jungle of undergrowth. A short distance down the river and a site is Rooster Rock, a shaft of stone shooting up from the earth perpendicularly on all sides to a height of 900 feet. The Mint Saloon was a resort for all the male inhabitants of that region. Mint, the proprietor, had married a box rustler in a Butte Variety Theater. By what form or ceremony, his most intimate friends never found out, and had brought his bride to this secluded spot. He had never told the boys why he had established himself so far away from civilization. In the winter time, Mint had about 40 regular patrons. Sometimes, when a number of them would meet at the saloon together, they would get into such a jolly condition that they would stay several days. At these prolonged festivals, Mrs. Mint would sometimes come in and dance jigs on the counter and recite dramatic parts of plays she used to figure in. When the revelers got to the point where they wanted something really exciting, they would gamble. The exchange of the stacks of cold coin was sometimes attended with the burning of powder. Tradition says that two stiffs, as corpses, were termed by this community, resulting from the gambling encounters. Rooster Rock has an interesting bit of history attached to it. In the tradition of the Indians, it marks the grave of a belligerent chief who was the head of the Yakimas, Umatillas, Snakes, Walla Wallas, and Kindred tribes. It is said this chief kept offending the Great Spirit by waging war against the tribes of the Lower Columbia. The cause of the troubles was the fisheries at the Dalles. At last the chief led his warriors down into the enemy's country in hot pursuit and camped upon their ground. He did this against the counsel of the leading men of the families. In the middle of the night, the heavens were afire, and there was a loud roaring noise such as the Indians had never heard before. A panic ensued, for everyone said that the great spirit was angry with the chief. In the midst of this, a flash of light shot across the sky like an arrow on fire and struck in the midst of the camp. The chief was killed and all his close counselors. The warriors retreated up the river and kept within their own territory. After this, the family separated and the head of the households formed new tribes, which were the Snakes, Cayuses, Umatillas, Yakimas, and Walla Wallas. When peace returned to the tribes, representatives from the tribes of the East floated in their canoes down to the place of the catastrophe. They beheld the massive shaft of granite which the white men calls Rooster Rock. Anyone who wants detective work done may leave his name and address at the Gazette office. Wanted, a middle-aged woman to do general housework. Proper person will have permanent position. For particulars, inquire at Gazette office. Spectacular entertainment. Many of our theater goers will hail with delight the appearance of Tisk's Living Pictures, which manager Fuller has engaged for one night, Tuesday, March 26th. Reproductions from live performers of famous works of art. Not objectionable. To the person of refinement and culture, these scenes are inspiring to the highest degree. It is like a walk through the statuary department in the art building at the World's Fair, except that in this play, nature is not so bold. There is nothing here that need offend even a prude. Evil only to him who evil thinks, and only the vulgar think evil of works of art.